is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative. We help you find your unique voice, find the right mindset to succeed, and we help you find the new opportunities to make a living making your art. I am David Cadavy, and I'm your host. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, just hit subscribe on your podcast app and you'll get these episodes delivered to you directly for free. And if you want the very best of Love Your Work, if you want the gems that I've discovered in my thousands of hours of research into history's greatest creators, all in a short weekly email, sign up for my Love Mondays newsletter. That is at academy.net slash Mondays. Serja Popovic is a revolutionary. He played a big part in overthrowing Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic. He now coaches activists around the world in nonviolent resistance techniques through CANVAS, which stands for Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies. This may seem a little bit out of left field to have a political activist on the show. Uh, it's not meant to be some thinly veiled political statement. Rather, I think anyone who is trying to get people on board with their message can really learn a lot from the techniques of revolutionaries. I recently read Serge's book, Blueprint for Revolution, How to Use Rice Pudding, Lego Men, and Other Nonviolent Techniques to Galvanize Communities, Overthrow Dictators, or Simply Change the World. And I was really blown away by the inventiveness and the deft strategy of the techniques that he shared in that book. It's a fascinating book, whether you're trying to overthrow a dictator or you're merely just trying to get people to read your blog. In this conversation, you're going to learn, we think Rosa Parks' courageous stand was a spontaneous event, like it just happened out of nowhere. Learn how it was actually a strategic hit, how it was designed for maximum effect. And if you're really trying to get people on board with your message, branding means a lot. It's everything, dare I say. Learn how a movement like Occupy Wall Street missed a golden branding opportunity. And effective activists choose tactics that have the most influence with the smallest risk. Learn Surge's brainstorming techniques for homing in on these tactics. It is a valuable exercise for any influencer. And this is an ad-free episode of Love Your Work. That means that it's brought to you entirely by our Patreon supporters. These Patreon supporters know the power of putting your money where your mind is. If you listen to Love Your Work regularly, why not make these lessons stick to your mind by supporting the show? Just a coffee a month is going to prime your brain for learning even more from each episode. Plus, you'll get bonus content. You'll get a discount on the Love Your Work Tri-Blend t-shirt. Sign up at patreon.com slash cadavy. That is patreon.com slash Cadavy. I want to start showcasing you and your work right here on Love Your Work with a listener showcase. Here's how it's going to work. Apply to be showcased at cadavy.net slash showcase. It's a really short application. I'm going to pick one lucky listener to mention on the show. I'll talk about your work, where our listeners can find you. And I've been trying to find new ways to show love for the listeners that I have. And I think this would be a good start. So again, That is cadavy.net slash showcase to be featured right here on Love Your Work. Can't wait to feature your work. Cadavy.net slash showcase. Here's Serja Popovich. Okay, I'm here with Serja Popovich, who is author of Blueprint for Revolution. And Serja, you're really well known for playing a big part in overthrowing uh, Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, that was a, a while ago, so I think that people's memories might not be totally fresh, but can you give us a summary of what was it about Milosevic that made him such a bad guy, and then what part did you play in getting rid of him? Well, I mean, uh, I'm I'm among these people who are accidental activists. Uh, uh, I, I got involved in struggle against Milosevic in my late teens, probably when I was 19 or 20. And at the time, I was playing a bass guitar in a rock band and thinking that uh, activism is mostly for old ladies who care for dogs' rights. Uh, but then uh, the world turned upside down with the coming of Milosevic to power in Serbia. Uh, basically, we had a large wave of nationalism. We had five wars with neighbors. We had one of the most awful ethnic cleansing in, in world's history back there in the 90s. Uh, we had the probably second or third world largest hyperinflation in 1993. So you are looking at a world that you're used to, uh, which used to be the normal, decent middle class life falling apart. You see your, your, your classmates uh, going to the, to the military service to kill people because they're all Croats or Bosnians or whatever. 
though being taught that these people are your brothers since you were the real kid. And you kind of get confused. And within the scope, uh, you have two chances. You can fight or you can flee. Unfortunately, uh, more than 350,000 young people left Serbia in 90s, including my own uh, brother. And I, I was too stubborn to flee. I decided to stand up and fight. So I was involved in students' movements uh, from 1992 to 96, 97. And then in 1988, we figured out that uh, there won't be astronauts coming to remove Milosevic, that uh, opposition is too weak and divided, that international community is uh, uh, a bit confused with what they want to do from uh, really making Milosevic their best friend into bombing Serbia in 1999. And we figured out that like the Tolkien's hobbits, there is nobody else to do the job. There is nobody else to take this ring to Mordor. So it has to be us. 998, uh, Otpor, which is the Serbian word for resistance, movement is is born out of the desperation and hope of 11 young people. And then over the scope of two years, we grew from 11 people to 70,000 strong, which is a pretty good concentration for a 6 million country. And we figured out on how to help opposition to unite. We mobilized the most important constituency in Serbian society, which is basically the youth. The average age in the movement was around 21. And uh, we figured out that uh, we can defend the vote. And actually, in 2000, we, we defeated Milosevic exactly against all odds. So this is a little bit of a, of a background story of uh, where I'm coming from and where I still live in Belgrade. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the, uh, well, what were you risking in doing what you were doing uh, to try to overthrow Milosevic? Well, I mean, when you are young and reckless, you don't think about risks uh, very much. And probably if you ask me at, at now at the age of 45, whether or not I would do the same thing, the answer would probably be pro quite different. Uh, but we were kind of risking a lot. Uh, Milosevic regime was was a, was a bureaucratic dictatorship. So your parents can, could lose the job. Uh, you could be arrested. I was arrested and beaten and, and gun was put in my mouth during 1998. And uh, I, I swallowed a lot of tear gas and more than 2.5 thousand people were actually detained. Uh, some of the key journalists were killed uh, through the Milosevic reign. So it was kind of reign of fear uh, run mostly uh, through the police and, and state control media. Uh, but other than just taking a risk, it was a lot of fun in it. And it was a lot of hope in it. And I think it was the fun and hope which uh, eventually broke over the fear and gave the people the idea that, yes, we can do something. And yes, that something can be funny and cool and in and we can enjoy with it with our with our uh, with our peers. And I think this peer element and community building were the real reasons why Otpar went through the through all the temptations of uh, running against the bad guy like the Milosevic was. Yeah. So you were in a situation where there was a, a, a regime that uh, may do some very bad things to you uh, if, if you aren't in line, but at the same time you wanted to uh, get rid of them. So how did you navigate that situation to, to make progress? Well, basically, we learned by making mistakes. And in, in many businesses, uh, it's very similar. We started in 1992 with a student protest, which were looking very much like American Occupy. You could see the young, urban, clever, educated people concentrating on a, on a campuses, uh, making it our own free territory, uh, singing all we are saying is give peace a chance. And Milosevic didn't care. He was looking at us as a zoo. And basically, he was sending tanks for wars in Croatia and Bosnia because he controlled the, the middle field and he controlled the, the majority of the water, waters, which, unlike us, wasn't urban, wasn't educated, was was living in villages and was very susceptible to his propaganda effort. 96, 97, we matured a little bit. We understood that if you need change aside of just anger or streets, you also need a political alternative. That this is where, for the first time in Serbian history, united opposition won local elections. Uh, faced with his first defeat, Milosevic annulled the results illegally, and that sparked 100 days of street demonstrations in over 40 cities. When you have 40 cities, when you have uh, everyday street demonstrations, you learn a lot of street smarts, you learn a lot of tactics, you learn about the street theater, you learn how to outrun the police, uh, you learn how to deal with the, with the immature opposition sometimes, and you also learn how to deal with the state front propaganda and keep spirits high even in the harsh winter when the things look hopeless. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, we, we, of course, were successful in, in 97. Milosevic recognized the local election results. And then, of course, the opposition split. 
So this is where we figure out the lesson number one, we need people from, from the villages. And lesson number two is that you need a political alternative. And if you can't persuade political alternative to act normally, then you cultivate the polit- political alternative. So 1998, when we started Otpor, we were pretty sure what we want to do. We want it to be funny, but serious. Uh, we want it to be strategic. We want it to orient the change around the momentum of elections. So the strategic approach was very clear. We understood that opposition will win only if it run united. So the part of the campaign was to unite the opposition. We understood that uh, the high turnout is what can prevent any kind of meddling with the ballot boxes, which is why we focused on a large nationwide rock concert type of get out to vote campaign for the young people. And most important, we were ready for the moment when Milosevic will lose. He's not going to accept the results and we need something to do about it. And that was not 100 uh, days of street demonstrations, but rather the seven days of Blitzkrieg through which you combine the street demonstrations with mass non-cooperation, general strike, especially in the energetic stra- sector, and then large uh, concentration tactic, bringing hundreds of thousands of people from the provinces in the capital Belgrade for a game over. So. Uh, we learned by doing, uh, same as, as in other things. We were not born with this skill. What was funny is when we got engaged in Otpor in 98, I was 25, already had like five day, five years of experience in, in street tactics. So, uh, we were, we were young, but kind of experienced. And I think, uh, uh, the, the spirit of friendship, the spirit of uh, mutual trust and the fact that we were fighting for good, uh, was a really important thing because you can't really push a lot of people through this, through these challenging times without a real hope or without a real vision of tomorrow. And as you were said, you were able to mobilize a lot of people, but I believe that took a little bit of, um, some smaller acts before that, leading up to that, to to make people willing to to do that, can you talk a little bit about how you got people on board? Well, I mean, we we uh, we did something which is very similar to startups. And uh, now, in my in my nowadays organization, my nowadays life, I'm advising movements uh, across the world for 15 years now. Uh, uh, it's it's even the module called Movement Startup. Uh, you start by looking at your personal networks and you mobilize and recruit the people you know. And then with the people you know, you bring out the vision or or a very short one pager of what is this movement is all about, what are the values, what is the commitment to nonviolence, which then can uh, serve as a presentation point for new people. Uh, in this early stage, you use the you use the recruitment strategy, which is known as a snowflake, meaning that every single person can, uh, by the principles of multi-level marketing, bring another people into the movement that he or she personally knows. Uh, this is where you gain uh, dozens of people, and with dozens of people, you're looking at the small, non, non low risk tactics. Uh, the trick of gaining numbers in nonviolent struggle is to understand the relationship between the participation and the risk bar. Not too many people will go on streets in Iran where they can go get shot, but a lot of people will do pots and pans and do the the funny uh, cell phone ringtones, even in the harsh oppression, because they can get away with it. So the trick uh, when launching a movement is figuring out what are the low risk tactics that people can participate, they can connect to the struggle, they can feel purposeful, they can disrupt the opponent, but they're still not risking their lives, their families or their jobs. Yeah, if you figure out these tactics, then spreading these tactics through your network will help you gain more people, which brings you to the second stage of the movement, which is called building stage. In the building stage, uh, you can engage a little bit, but then you grow movement out to several hundreds. With several hundred people, you can do uh, probably 30% of all tactics uh, known from Gene Sharp's list of 200 tactics of nonviolent resistance. Uh, we did a lot of street theater, we did a lot of pranks, we did a lot of stickers, we did a lot of graffiti, and we were basically focusing on the things that people can do to send a message, but still not risking their life or their freedom. Once the movement grow to formidable size, which is several thousand, then you start building the local networks, and this is where you start preparing your movement for a final showdown. Uh, that means you understand the strategy, that means you understand the battlefield, and that means you're building towards the situation where where this uh, step-by-step growth can turn into the exponential growth. But you're not waiting for the exponential growth, you're preparing the organization that can put the exponential growth in the, in the use. So there are two levels in which you're building your movement. One is, of course, the mobilization. People mobilize around the, the different stuff. We've seen the several waves of mobilization only in the last year or so in the United States. The question uh, uh, that determines uh, the, the, the random protests 
from uh, the viable movement is whether you are able to carry on the organization effort, which follows the mobilization, which recruits people and which creates network, which is active between the two waves of mobilization. So we were, we were looking at this doctrine and we were doing it a lot, starting with the small activities. Our first thing was graffiti, continuing it with the street theater, then changing it into the rock concert, then going to the small rally. Also varying these activities help people feel funny, but also makes you unpredictable for your opponent because if they know you're be going to be on the same square at the same time every week, they'll be prepared. And you want to catch your opponent off guard if you want to be successful in nonviolent struggle. And you mentioned street theater, you mentioned pots and pans and ringtones. Uh, can you talk a bit about like what street theater is and, and, and what you mean by pots and pans and ringtones specifically and uh, why those tactics are useful? Well, uh, when you take a look at what's available and when you take a look at how you prepare tactics, and this is basically the thing which we're doing with the movements across the world, you want to take a look at what you want to achieve with the tactics. And too often, people get involved in tactics just because they like it. Oh, wow, we are angry with the president. Let's go on street and yell. Uh, instead of that, strategic approach to the movement uh, uh, understands that the tactics uh, have three different outcomes. Uh, they either disrupt your opponent's business as usual, uh, they, uh, they build the morale of your own organization and your own supporters, or they are bringing people who are still undecided on your side. So depending on what you want to achieve, uh, and depending, of course, the environment, and the level of risk, you're looking at the different tactics. So one of the first campaigns we started was promoting the idea of the resistance. So there were so many bad things in the society, uh, misery, poverty, corruption, repression, sanctions, war. So we combined one of these words like misery, resistance, corruption, resistance. And we put it on a very small stickers. Stickers are great because people can put them with no risk and they can be in elevators, they can be in a, in a different places people pass by. And one person can put a lot of street stickers which creates the pre presence of the movement across the neighborhood. Uh, uh, street theater is a very popular thing and we did it a lot in Serbia. That basically means that you're trying to send a message by visually rehearsing or visually playing something like a, like a real theater, the thing that you want to, 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 uh, uh, to deliver a message on. Uh, during the time of the, of the solar eclipse in Serbia, there was a solar eclipse in, in uh, late 1999. We organized a street theater with a 4.5 meters cardboard telescope where pie busters can take a look through the telescope, but instead of sun, they will see the Milosevic face in the shape of the falling star or the comet. So the thing was like, oh, even the sky is sending us a message that Milosevic is falling. It was funny, it was colorful, it was a great thing for media. For Milosevic's birthday, we delivered a cake, cardboard cake, and each piece of cake was one part of the territory that Milosevic has lost in his futile wars, except, of course, the center of the cake, which was the posh part of town where he lived happily in his little castle. So that was the only part of the cake which was intact and kicking. So doing things like this, uh, meaning that, A, you have a creativity and you have a great people in your team, but it also means that with a limited number of resources, actually street theaters cost between one and 200 bucks if you want to, to, to do them correctly. And with a relatively small amount of dozen of people, you can create the great pictures for the, for the media. And we did a lot of street theater uh, uh, over and over because it was also less risky. The street theater is not normally something that police will arrest you upon. And even if they do, what are the charges? I mean, you made a cardboard cake. That's not a punishable criminal act. So uh, from that, you go to the little bit larger scale actions. You, you are thinking on a, on a, on a street marches. You are thinking at a little concert. Uh, you are thinking on something that you can repeat, uh, through the different geography or through the different constituencies. And this is where the real mastery of the nonviolent struggle comes in, uh, because, uh, uh Yes, the tactics are important and tactics catch the attention of the people and media, but tactics may fit in the larger strategy. So every time you're thinking about a tactic, you need to understand what you are targeting. And one, one perfect example of that in the American history is uh, talking about the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, what is funny, I, I, I teach NYU, I teach Harvard, I teach Colorado College, I had a lot of American students, and every time I mention that, they, the, the story comes like, oh, you know, this is a Rosa Parks, this brave woman, she decided not to stand when the white man came in and asked her to stand, and this is how all of this stuff started. Uh, this is not how all of this started. 
started because to understand how it started, you need to ask yourself a question. Why Montgomery and why buses? Uh, why not Chicago and subway system? So the Montgomery bus boycott was a strategic estimate of American civil rights movement that it is the business uh, which is vulnerable to the, to the boycotts and actions of non-cooperation. So white mayors and white governors will not change their view on segregation if you bring, I don't know how many people in front of the city halls. But if you tackle the business that is funding their campaigns, they may be changing their opinions. And they're also looking at where they are strong and their opponent, the segregationists, were weak. And it was the majority of people of color using the public transportation. So they were using the power that they had, the power to decide not to use the public transport, to hurt white business. So they ran to mayors and say the segregation of buses is a bad idea. Uh, this is how you think strategically about your tactics, and it's where the tactics really works. So this is not let's go on street, grab a transparent or two, and start chanting uh, against the best president. It's more of understanding the battlefield, understanding which institutions need to be swayed, and finding ways to put your numbers in its best use. And one of the things that was really interesting that I learned from the book was that I always thought that the Arab Spring was just, oh, it happened through Twitter and it was this spontaneous thing. Uh, but it turns out, as you said, with the the uh, civil rights movement, that it was actually quite strategic. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. The, the Arab Spring as a phenomenon had this uh, spontaneous part and it started in Tunisia uh, by the by, the street vendor uh, putting himself in flames and sparking the wide movement, but that movement was already thinking strategically because they were doing a peaceful demonstrations while persuading the main pillar of of uh, support for Tunisian president, the military, uh, to stay aside. Uh, uh, Twenty days later, the Egypt started, and what was interesting about the Egypt is because uh, there was already groups that were planning for for launching the large demonstrations. And some of them were youth groups, some of them were, were more conservative groups, but they were looking at the period where Mubarak uh, has to name a successor, which should have happened in the August that year. Uh, they or organized politically, they got slammed, then they understood that the way to work was through the labor unions and, and demands which are less political, which is how the April 6th, the movement which was pivotal in the Egyptian revolution, really got its name. It got its name over the crackdown of the police on a, on a labor movement demonstrations. Basically, the key of the Arab Spring was understanding that uh, there should be unity in the movement and to the amazing level, uh, specifically in Egypt, uh, the movement came up with a, with a unity between the young urban protesters. And yes, many of them were using the, the new media. And yes, a lot of the organization and tactical efforts were done through the Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but the strategy was to understand that, that they can't win without the Muslim Brotherhood and they can't win without the religious minority of Coptic Christians. So you could see uh, iconic scenes of a Coptic wedding cheered by thousands of Muslims on Tahrir Square. You could see Christians physically protecting Muslims while they were praying from the police. And uh, you could see all of these elements of unity were there. Uh, second element of strategy was, of course, that they were playing the, the two cards that were most important for removal of Mubarak. One, persuading the military that they are not their opponent because of the power of the military in the Egyptian society, hugging the, the troops and putting flowers on tanks, in the same time trying to persuade the international community that any change in Egypt will allow secularists to have some kind of the upper hand. Because one of the reasons why a Western international community was supporting military dictatorship in Egypt for years was its threat that somehow the evil people will beat beards will come in. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news was that, uh, that after the victory and after the Mubarak stepped down, there was no follow up. And many movements, uh, actually over 50% of the movements are capable of achieving victory through the mass, uh, mass mobilization. Uh, but less than half of them is capable to keep on the victory. And what is really interesting is that, uh, in our teachings and in our analysis in my book, probably 20% of what I call surviving victory. So how do you prepare for day after? What are the institutions you need to build? How you can make this change permanent? So it's not only making a, a, a bad guy step down, or it's not only allowing the new people to take the office. It is about the values and it is about the permanent social change that you are standing for and you need to make it permanent. That means you need to work more after 
the real change. And this is where the tough work starts. After the revolution in Serbia, I went for three years into the government and the parliament. And looking to the change from the inside actually persuaded me that it's actually far more easy to outrun the police, even in the oppressive system, because it's sexy, because it's cool, and because all of your friends are there, whether from the halls of power, uh, each change really faces to a to, uh, really wide opposition because the system itself is positioned, so it's very difficult to change. And then the people want too much too fast and you can't deliver on it. So it's a very desperate try. So taking this into consideration, you need to figure out that the movements are actually having uh, three big stages. One, you launch the movement, you build the movement, you build the formidable organization. Two, you build the movement to the mo- momentum and then you achieve the victory, whatever is your change, whether these are the gay rights or human rights or, or, or any kind of rights, whether this is a change of the, of the government or change of a official. But then the third part is really important. How do you turn this change into something permanent. And I think more emphasize of, of the groups like Canvas and more emphasize from the, from the academic, uh, uh, academic community is needed to figure out what is these things that we can help emerging democracies not to backslide back to the dictatorships. And one of the, I guess, categories of tactics, or maybe it is a strategy that you talk about in the book is, is laughtivism. Uh, so laugh to vism, activism, laugh to vism. Can you talk a little bit about laugh to vism? Well, uh, humor uh, has a great role in nonviolent struggle. And uh, uh, the, the, the first the humor breaks fear. And you know this from your common life. I, I had to go to the surgery recently. And the last thing I wanted to hear is about how the procedure will go on which metal parts they're going to put into my stomach. Instead of that, my, my wife cracked the joke and the fear instantly disappeared. Second very important element of humor is that humor attracts people. And when you start thinking about the boring party in which you were and then the few pranksters appear and turn it into the really good evening, or when you start looking at your phone book and start thinking, who are the most interesting people that I really know? It's never the richest one or the most educated one or the one with the biggest car. It's somebody who can make you always laugh. Uh, the third element of humor is where we are looking at the loftivism. Loftivism, uh, uh, it comes from the idea that a strategic approach to nonviolent struggle means that you're able to put your opponent in a dilemma. And loftivism is the dilemma action combined with a little bit of humor. Let me explain the dilemma action. A typical example is the Gandhi salt march. During the anti-colonial struggle, Gandhi picked the issue which was tackling all Indians, and all Indians need salt, and salt was heavily taxed. Uh, it made absolutely no sense because anybody can make salt. All you need is a little bit of a sea coast and the sun. India has 4.5 thousand miles of the sea coast. And he decided that he's going to lead a group of people to the sea coast and start making salt for himself to see whether the Brits will arrest him or not. This is the element of the dilemma. If the Brits, Brits arrest him, they will ultimately make him a national hero and he'll be released under the, the small bail because obviously uh, that was not the major criminal offense. If Brits don't arrest him, then anybody uh, can make salt. Nobody is going to pay taxes and the Brits are defeated. So this is the genius of dilemma action is putting your opponent between the rock and the hard place. Uh, What we were uh, dealing with in Serbia was uh, a dilemma action combined with a little bit of humor. So we started out of the thin air with the idea that we can put Milosevic, uh, president's face, on the petrol bottle, that we can bring the petrol bottle to the main pedestrian district, that uh, people can put a little coin like in a pinball machine and earn themselves a five minutes of joy of hitting the barrel with a big bat. And of course, what happens when you hit the barrel with a big bat, it sounds loud. So soon there were like uh, probably 200 people lining up for hitting the barrel and the kids were kicking the barrel and, and, and this was happening in the most populated Serbian downtown shopping district. So we pull back to the reserve position, we ordered espresso and just monitor the situation. Uh, everybody had fun, but the really funny part was when police arrived, because you can imagine their dilemma. Somebody told them that there is an insult to the president that they need to stop. They arrived on the spot. The barrel is there. It's surrounded by downtown shoppers. The kids are hitting the barrel. Organizers of this prank are nowhere to be seen. Arresting the people... Uh, 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 who were who were downtown shoppers and hitting the barrel is out of question because, you know, they can take them to the police station and accuse them for what? And then, of course, they did the most stupid thing. They arrested the barrel. 
So the photograph of people throwing the barrel into the police car became really popular with the uh, with the Serbian independent media of the time. So A, you you made Milosevic look ridiculous. B, uh, you 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 put him in a barrel and show that he's afraid of the people hitting the barrel. And C, you show that you're not afraid of the police, but you make police the part of your show. And it's all done with a little bit of creativity and the old petrol bottle. Well, optimism is an amazing phenomenon and it works cross-cultural, works uh, cross-geographical. Uh, almost any contemporary struggle you want to take a look has an element of act- activism. Whether you're looking at amazing toy protests which were held in Russia during 2012 demonstrations where demonstrations were, were banned in small places so people came to the idea that maybe if, they're, if they're, they can protest, their toy ca- toys can. So in Siberia, in a little town of Barnaul, the people really built a little Lego town populated with uh, kinder toys that were demonstrating with a little transparent uh, claiming free and fair elections. And you can see the actual footage. It sits on Guardian's website right now of people having fun. Even the police was taping this and everybody was really de-stressed. Uh, the real problem uh, came when the, when the toy protests become vital. So there were like over 1 million views within the few, first few hours on the YouTube. So somebody has seen it in Kremlin, called the chief of police in Barnaul, and the poor soul had to do the most stupid statement in the history of the police force, claiming, uh, quote, that the announced protest of 100 legal soldiers, 50 toy cars, is banned because the uh, toys are not citizens of Russia. And by constitution, only the citizens of Russia can demonstrate so now you're looking at Putin, the man who spends a lot of time posing for us, wrestling tigers, diving on for us, or, or saving dolphins from drowning, and he's afraid of toys. And this is the beauty of the loftivism, is that they put your opponent between the rock and hard place. If he or she doesn't react, they will look weak. If he or she does react, he looks stupid. So this is the beauty of the leftivism, and this is why humor brings such a powerful element of the nonviolent struggle. So once again, if you are thinking of changing the community, think about doing something funny because humor breaks fear and apathy. Humor brings the cool element to the movement and the cool movements have a better chance to recruit cool people and then the other people follow. And last but not least importance, if you're really thinking out of the box, you can figure out how to make your opponent in the situation where he or she uh, is between the rock and the hard place. And very likely, whatever he or she does can be used as a punchline for the next prank. And as you said, laftivism makes the movement cool and and the movement being cool makes it such that a larger number of people are uh, interested in in joining that. Uh, So the branding of of the movement also, or or I guess maybe the positioning as well, is an important component of that. And, And something interesting that I saw in the book was your analysis of, say, Occupy Wall Street as, you know, how could that movement uh, ha- have been done better so that more people would have been on board with it? Yeah, one of the one of the main, main things that distinguishes the random protests from a structured movement is a movement identity. Uh, identity doesn't only mean uh, that, that you have the group of the people who want the same thing. Uh, it also means values. It also means uh, how you behave. It also means uh, the, the stances you have. And of course, I can give you the, the simple example. Any of your listeners who is uh, environmentally concerned, as I am, is probably turning every electrical uh, outlet off when he or she leaves the home. And I do the same. So we are repeating the very similar pattern of behavior because we care for environment and very similarly with recycling and some other stuff. So this is the type of identity you want to build in your nonviolent movement. And this is where the symbols and colors and anthems and music and all of this stuff that we can uh, mar- ma- marketing-wise call branding, but it's much more than this. It's a part of the common identity. The Serbian clenched fist, uh, the Serbian, uh, the, mod, the, the symbol of the Serbian movement was a clenched fist. And that relates both to the idea of the unity and strength, but it also relates to the idea that, that uh, Serbia had a very vivid past and a very powerful anti-fascist movement uh, during the Second World War. And these partisans, how we called them, were saluting each other for the, for, with a, with a, with a with a fist. So also you can use the fist to salute and to gesture on the demonstrations. You can use it as a recognition sign. So if you and I bypass on the street, we share the same opinion. I show you a little clenched fist as a, as a symbol of support. You show me one. We both know we are not alone. 
So this kind of stuff uh, uh, that can be put under branding is a very important thing. The thing with branding is that it needs to be appealing. And this is where we're in the blueprint of revolution. I did a lot of emphasis on the idea of the Occupy. You never brand movement per tactic. Because if the name of the movement is Occupy, then occupation, which is only one out of 200 different tactics, is the only thing that you can do. And even if I relate to your idea of the social justice, because I'm having a full-time work, because I'm traveling 100 days a year, and because I'm having a wife and two small kids, I'm completely unable to participate in your Occupy movement because I can't sit in Sukkoti all day long and Occupy think. Well, what about thinking about branding your movement per we are 99%? This is far more appealing. A, there are so many people who can relate to it. B, there are so many different things that you can build around the idea of the 99% from simple things like uh, physical branding, badges, T-shirt, uh, to, the, to the more courageous things like graffiti or, or stickers. And when you take a look at the number of tactics that you can exercise, it probably triples or, or quadruples the number of tactics that you can exercise if you limit your branding to, to only one. So thinking about how you brand your movement, thinking about how people express their belongings and taking a look at the case studies uh, from uh, from white in actual demonstrations in Venezuela to orange in actual demonstrations in Sudan to orange in, in orange revolution in, in Ukraine, you can see that people were using different artistic color or music things that were connecting them together, that were building the sense of unity, that were sending the message, but in the same time were appealing to the people outside of the movements because the movements become successful not when they bring all the people who think alike in one echo chamber and then tweet each other to death. The, the movements become realistically strong when they can appeal across social groups. Uh, so you have two elements of success in movement. One is participation. Once again, if you recruit, if you have appealing brand, if you have uh, values that people can stand for, and if you build numbers uh, through your through your uh, startup model, then you will gain participation. But for the participation, diversity comes next. If you see only the movement of certain age or the certain color or the certain social group, that means uh, that you're actually attacking a very narrow social niche. If, however, you pe- feel people across the spectrum, education, wealth, age, or race, this where your movement becomes really successful and appealing. So making it successful and appealing relates to understanding what your vision is, understanding the realistic strategy, understanding the hard organizational work, but also, yes, making it cool and branding it properly. Well, and, and also, as you as you mentioned, getting a lot of people on, on board with it, having a, a, a very diverse group of people who are interested in it. Uh, one thing I found that was interesting from your observations about Occupy Wall Street was that there was this sort of meme going around about the 1%, about uh, it was about wealth and inequality, about the majority of the wealth being with the top 1%. And that they missed an opportunity, perhaps, by not calling themselves the 99%. Absolutely. Once again, uh, you want to be the many, uh, making your opponent being a few. And let's dig a little bit more into one American case study that we examine a lot in the book. And if whoever listens to this haven't seen Milk, the movie about Harvey Milk, the first elected official who was openly LGBT in U.S., he or she should go and watch it now because it's a great lesson aside of Sean Penn being, being amazing in that uh, movie. Uh, so Harvey Milk was, uh, was a gay activist from San Francisco uh, who came to the idea that somehow he needs to make this thing main- mainstream. And that was the revolutionary idea at the time because uh, that was the time where being gay was considered to be a mental illness in the United States. So aside of the harsh oppression and uphill struggle, Harvey starts, he starts campaigning, uh, spreading leaflets, recruiting people, talking about the gay rights, organizing even small boycotts in the bars where that were, where gay people were not served or the, or, or these, these type of actions. And, uh, he decides he wants to run for the office of the, of the San Francisco city council. So he starts like a annoying soapbox preacher, ends up being ninth. Uh, he evolves into a more mainstream looking politician with a tie. He ends up being third. And then he figures out that it's not about talking people to death. It's about listening to the people. So instead of, of running into his third, uh, third uh, run without preparation, he starts listening to the constituency and starts understanding what the people in San Francisco really want from their city councilor. 
And uh, to his amazement and surprise, he figured out that the biggest plague in San Francisco uh, was not discrimination, but uh, something that uh, brutal and, 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 and easy as a uh, dog's poop. And now, instead of uh, putting the rights in the center of his campaign, he staged a very good televised show, which, which you can actually see in the movie. He steps in a dog's poop in front of the TV camera, and he takes a disgusted look at his shoe and says, okay, I agree uh, that this is the biggest problem of San Francisco, and whether gay or straight, I am the counselor that will curtail you of this menace. He gets elected, the rest is victory. So understanding the way you appeal to 99% or whatever percent you want to appeal, understanding that you need to listen to these people, understanding that you need to put their grievances into your vision of tomorrow, makes you capable of mobilizing and organizing outside uh, of, of just your, your little constituency or your little voting base. Getting out of the box, getting out of the of the eco chamber and getting out of the blurbs is what distinguishes uh, uh, popular movements and successful social movements than just the small grumpy sects of people that complain about everything. Mm -hmm. There's a quote from your book that I really enjoyed. It said, you may accuse people who just care about taking it one day at a time and tending their own garden of being selfish or blind or even immoral. Uh, the worst activists I've ever seen did just that. They got nowhere because it's unrealistic to expect people to care about more than what they already care about, and any attempt to make them do so is bound to fail. So you kind of have to hold back a little bit and pick your battles in these situations, right? Because you you want people to care about this this thing, but they don't, and so you need to get them to care about something that they already care about. Is that about right? Well, I mean, the, the, there, there are several, several, like the, especially the purpose driven movements, the movements for rights, the movements for environment, the, the things that you can't really put a finger on really need, uh, need, uh, understanding on how to communicate the importance of these things to the people that don't care. And it is the people who don't care who really make a difference. And the popular way to call them in US, if I'm not wrong, is couch potato wars. And how do you get the climate change to the couch potato wars? By giving them the scientific figures, uh, the complicated 350, uh, whatever per, per, per part of the, of the air, uh, talking about the polar bears or really exotic things, or really taking a look at how the climate change tackles these people. And I, I re reflect over and over. Uh, always to, to the conversations I have with the living people. And I teach in Colorado and Colorado Springs is one of the most beautiful places in US I ever visited. And this is where I went to the, to the little riding on a, this Westernese riding uh, with a guy who lives in the ranch who never went out of the place called George Lake or Lake George, which is like 300, uh, 3000 inhabitants. And uh, he's your typical couch potato guy that wouldn't understand the polar bear and environment. Well, he tells me the story that uh, ranches across the Colorado are losing their cattle because of the draft. And then the big companies come in because the small uh, small businesses can't cope with it and buy their businesses from it and they, they need to move. And now these little towns like uh, Lake George uh, have their citizens left because they have no business. And this is where you really start figuring out how to connect what tackles this person's life with the climate change because draft comes from the climate change. And this is where you need to disguise yourself as a cow as opposed to the polar bear, uh, figuratively speaking, in order to get your message through. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're compromising with your message. That just means that by listening to the people you need to get to, you modify your message and you modify your behavior in order to get them on board. Because this is the type of the wars you need to sway if you want the climate change champions to get elected. Well, I mean, I think one of the most striking examples in the book was a story about a civil rights leader organizing a march and saying, we don't want to have any interracial couples in this march because that's not the, the battle that we're fighting. Like today, we think that that, uh, well, the, how could he have said that? But it was a strategic decision that helped pick those battles and, and make progress. Is that about right? Yes. Uh, it's uh, like you need to understand that nonviolent social change looks more like the marathon than the sprint. And very often people want to do everything today. Uh, but it is actually the step by step process. And each step means you are picking the battle you can win. 
you're making a tactic that can work, you're exercising this tactic properly, you are proclaiming the small victory, you're recruiting more people, you're gaining more authority, you're regrouping, and then you're preparing for the next floor and next floor and next floor. And even the tallest building in the world can be climbed up. And I, I was witnessing one of these ridiculous Chicago marathons to one of the tallest buildings well, two years ago, and I was shocked by the number of the people that will run on the stairs. But I assume they sustain up to the 150, I don't know, whatever floor, uh, is because understanding that they need to to somehow uh, the the take care of their strength through the process, and they need a certain speed at the first 10 floors, and then the next 10 floors, and they need to pause at the 30th floor, and this is how they get actually on the top if they're running up the stairs. Very similarly, you need to understand that there are battles that can be won now, but there are battles that need to be dealt later. And the person you named from, from the book is actually Jim Lawson, one of the genius uh, organizers of civil rights movement. And there's an actual footage of him uh, preparing activists from one of the marches in the in the Birmingham, uh, Alabama. And uh, literally, he says something like this. Tomorrow is a big day. We are going to march to, to they were preparing the, the, the boycotts of the food courts that were also segregated. That was another very clever target uh, for the business because even the white business didn't understand uh, why, the, food, why the, the people of color, can they spend their money in the food court while at the same time spending the money in mall. So it was really cleverly selected target. So we are going to march on the on the on on these malls tomorrow, and I want you all to be dressed like you're going on the Sendai Mess because we want to address this misconception that Afro Americans are somehow homeless or dirty or whatever. So I want you to look neat in your best clothes, and I want the white person walking next to the black person because the cameras will be there, and we want to send a strong message that this is not only the movement of people of color, but it is also the movement of the all normal people for the equality in the United States. But I don't want to see the white woman walking next to the black man. We are not ready for this yet. And this yet, if you highlight it, actually outlines the whole strategy. So when you're looking at especially these big changes, the struggle for human rights, for example, you need to take it one step at a time. And yes, uh, we can imagine the world in which Saudi Arabia uh, will become the a women equal country tomorrow morning. But first we need to make women capable of driving cars because in that country, the women are not allowed to drive cars. So typically breaking down this, this big thing into the small victories or how one of the chapters in the book is named, think big, start small, is how you really launch things. Because it is these small things and, and, and small victories that are giving people boost that are reminding people that are on the right track. And they're also getting the wider population used that the victories can be achieved through the protest movements and nonviolent struggle, so they're more likely to participate. Uh, there's so much more that we could talk about. I think this is a, a, a good note uh, to end on. I think that there's a lot to think about in terms of whether you are trying to uh, spark a revolution or ignite a movement or you just want to get people on board with your own message. I think our listeners have a lot to think about. Uh, do you have any final words? And then finally, where can people find out more about you? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, if you want to change the world, start now. It's always the good time. Uh, second, even the smallest creature can change the world. And the Serbian students are living proof of it. Or the Sudanese students that are actually fighting one of the uh, most hideous uh, war criminals in power as we speak uh, now. Uh, third, uh, uh, if you want to change the world, uh, make sure that you 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 understand the substance. There will be nobody else to fight this battle for you. It has to be you. So you need to rely on yourself and your friends, and this is how you start the movement. Uh, if you like the book, its name is Blueprint for Revolution. I promise you can read it in two or three days. It's not boring. It's quite funny. I think you can buy it on Amazon. And of course, if you are interested in learning more about the nonviolent struggle, the name of our organization is Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies. Short for it, it's Canvas. You can find a lot of resources, including the really cool animated uh, cartoons that are explaining the main concepts of nonviolent struggle on www.canvasopedia.org. Have a great day. Sergio, thank you so much for being on. I love the book so much, so I, I have to add on to that. It's called Blueprint for Revolution, How to Use Rice Pudding, Lego Man, and Other Nonviolent Techniques to Galvanize Communities, Overthrow Dictators, 
or simply change the world. And it really is an easy and engaging and an entertaining read. I love the book so much. I think everybody should go get that. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Pleasure being with you and have a great day. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work that you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep Love Your Work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash That's patreon.com slash K-A, D as in David, A, V as in Victor, Y. And if you can't support the show financially, and you've listened to at least three episodes, can you do me a favor? Write a review on Apple Podcasts. You can consider it your donation to help support the show. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsors Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com and Paula Spriggs, and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pinkovichis. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc.